All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us from many different parts of the world. We're really excited uh, to be gathering today uh, for a very special uh, technical talk on causal inference and LLMs. Um, I am delighted to be kicking this off. This is the, going to be the first in a series of talks on the current state of play in LLMs. Uh, we plan to cover research and applications um, and really all of the most interesting and important advances in AI technology as it progresses at lightning speed today. Um, so these talks are hosted by Metaculus, an organization I'm very proud to represent. We are a global hub for quantified collective intelligence. And on our public platform at metaculus.com, we train forecasters, we identify top talent, and we also provide a public benefit in the form of forecasts um, on the most important global topics. We also work with governments and nonprofit institutions to provide forecasting and modeling decision support in four main topic areas, biosecurity, nuclear risk, climate change, and of course, AI, which is what today is all about. So if you'd like to find out more about our work, you can visit us at metaculus.com. And today I have the distinct honor of welcoming two very special guests, Amit and Emre. We are thrilled to have you here. And I know the Metaculus team and the audience are really looking forward to diving into your presentation. We had over 300 people RSVP for today. I can see there's already 95 people who have joined the session. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, Amit Sharma and Emre Kisiman are from Microsoft Research. They are both experts in causal inference. And today they're gonna to be talking about the intersection of causal inference and LLMs, which they explored in their most recent paper. So, Without further ado, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Gaia. We're really happy to be here um, and looking forward to the discussion today with, with uh, this wonderful audience. Uh, my name is Emre. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research, and I'll hand it off to um, Amit to talk about our work here with uh, joined with Robert uh, Ness from MSR and Chen Hao Tan from the University of Chicago. Thank you so much, Emre. Uh, I'm just starting my slideshow. So are my slides visible correctly? Okay. Uh, as Emre said, we are glad to have a chance to present our work. Uh, I'm Amit Sharma, uh, and this is joint work with Robert Ness and Chen Hao Tan our co-authors. Uh, so just a bit of personal story. When we started, uh, we were quite skeptical about the capabilities of large language models for causal reasoning. Uh, and for obvious reasons, right? We are researchers in this topic of causality. And we were like, how can you infer cause and effect by reading just large amounts of text, right? Without any interventions. Uh, that's just not possible. But as we explored more and more, uh, we were first surprised uh, and then impressed to some extent with the results that we were getting. Uh, and that's what today's talk is about. We're gonna share our journey and our results uh, on how we believe now LLMs may open a new frontier for causal research and practice. So if you're like us, when ChatGPT was launched, you also might have tried many different queries, sometimes just to test the limits of its reasoning, right? And since we work in causality, we tried a bunch of causal queries. Here's an example of that. So the situation is that there's a toy shop owner uh, and they launch a new ad for their toys in December and they see a lot of increase in their sales. Uh, as you can see in this prompt, we, are, we just gave some numbers like 10,000 in October and about 13,000 in December. Now we asked GPT-4, is this increase in sales due to the ad or not? Uh, and here, if you look at GPT-4's response, uh, it's quite good. Uh, in fact, it sort of tells us that correctly that holiday season effect might be in play. December is holiday season. 
And so it recommends us to conduct an A-B test. Wow, right? So now it, it knows that it cannot trust the observational data, and it also knows what an A-B test is. While that's impressive, when we ask a follow-up question about another observational study, uh, we get a different kind of response. So here we just say that now this same toy shop owner was showing the old ad in newspapers and was showing the new ad into an online audience, right? Now, as people in who know causal inference, you would see here that this data is also confounded. It could just be that the online audience simply tends to buy more, uh, and that's why the new ad was giving more sales. But now if you look at GPT's answer, it's fooled. So it does believe that the increase in sales is due to the new ad and incorrectly concludes that the new ad is more effective. Hmm. So that's a bummer, right? So in fact, this is not just about one example. In general, answering whether LLMs have causal reasoning capability is a really hard question. And part of the reason is that there's not one, but many kinds of causal reasoning. Uh, as researchers or as practitioners, as Gaia was mentioning in forecasting, you might be typically thinking of causal tasks. You might think of discovery, you might think of effect inference, forecasting, attribution, and so on. But there are actually many kinds of causality that people practice. So let's take another example from our toy shop. Uh, suppose that person wants to increase their sales. From that high level question, they may break it down into multiple sub questions, some of which we may, may be data based or what we call covariance based causality, which might be what is the effect of new ad on monthly sales. And while others might be more logic based, right? So they might be more about, hey, my sales register broke down. Why did it? Does it keep malfunctioning and in interrupt my sales? Uh, so while we have this sort of differences between logic-based and covariance-based causality, there's also this question of what exactly do we want to measure, right? Do we want to measure sales overall, which is typically called type causality, or are we interested in purchases by a single customer or a single event, uh, which is known as actual causality? And so if you have to answer the question of can LLMs do causal, causal reasoning, we really also have to ask, so which of these kinds of causal reasoning do we mean? And which of these can LLMs actually do? Well, long story short, we cannot answer fully that question for you today. Uh, it's a very hard question. Instead, what we will do is we will provide a very practical take, irrespective of whether LLMs can actually do causal reasoning, their capabilities today are already useful for causal reasoning tasks that I just described to you earlier. In fact, they have a potential of sort of assisting in each of those loops that we were just looking at. How, you might ask? Well, they do it through almost like a backdoor, if you can pardon the pun. So essentially they are inferring and providing domain knowledge to causal inference tasks which is often the hardest piece in any causal analysis. And so this domain knowledge is what the human beings or the people doing the analysis typically have been burdened with uh, to bring to any causal analysis. And we'll talk about examples later, uh, but across all these different kinds of causal reasoning tasks, domain knowledge is a key prerequisite, right? It's not that it's, it sort of just helps you, it actually determines how good your analysis is based on how well you've modeled the existing relationships in your data. So what we'll do today is show you how by inferring and capturing the domain knowledge from its training data, large language models can help us with both covariance-based and logic-based causality. And what we're gonna show you is for covariance-based, how LLMs can be used to learn causal graphs which is actually one of the hardest questions uh, in the past decades of causality research. And in part two, we'll move on to actual causality, which also has been a really vexing question for causality research. And we'll show you how LRMs sort of come in and help us make progress uh, on questions that were deemed very hard early on. And finally, my the colleague Embray will also discuss a new frontier uh, and by what that we mean, 
how will these new results change causality, practice, and research? Right. So we believe there are some things that will change, some things that won't, and we'll talk about those in detail. If you want the quick TLDR, here it is. So more specifically, well, the two questions we ask, uh, we get positive answers, but we also get some limitations, right? So can LLMs learn causal graphs? Past work showed promising results on small uh, networks, maybe three or four nodes. While for bigger networks, the answer seemed to be no. Uh, maybe it just requires uh, too much to ask for an LLM. But actually, we've experimented over multiple data sets across multiple domains and scientific fields. And we believe the answer is yes. And actually, we can get significantly higher accuracy than current state-of-the-art methods. On the second question, can LLMs answer counterfactual queries and infer actual cause? Here, it was interesting because there's no prior method. This whole question itself is, is so hard that there were no existing methods that went directly from text to actual cause, right? So directly from you asking, why did my sales register break to, to an actual cause for that event? So here our answer is mixed. Uh, we find that only some LLMs like GPT-4 can do reasonably well on such queries, but also the limits are not well understood. And finally, as I said, uh, the big question of whether LLMs can do causal reasoning, uh, We'll be happy to discuss it after the talk, uh, but for now, I think we, we think it needs more research and it needs more work to properly answer this question. All right, so with that intro, let's dive right into part one, which is causal discovery. Can LLMs help us learn the causal graphs for our tasks? So as I was saying earlier as well, uh, why I was talking so much about domain knowledge, uh, that's because domain knowledge is critical for any causal analysis. So be it effect inference, be it prediction, attribution, almost all causal analysis first start with the analyst modeling their world or modeling the system that they're analyzing, right? So I'm giving you an example for effect inference where an expert might have their data, but then they would also encode their domain knowledge about how that data works by typically a causal graph, right? So essentially what that does is that it tells you how the different variables in your data set interact, uh, which one causes the other and which ones may not cause the other, right? And just based on this graph, all the rest of the analysis flows, right? So based on your graph, you would determine what are the right variables to condition on? And then you'll also find what are the good estimators and so on. And so in causal tasks, it's important to notice that learning the correct causal graph is often half job done and also the most important task uh, for us. And that's why we thought, let's try LLMs on this task and see if we can make any progress. And the other reason that you might think we also chose uh, causal graph discovery is because it's very challenging. Uh, even if you take the simplest possible causal discovery task, which is often known as pairwise discovery in the literature, uh, theoretically, it's, it's impossible to do that from uh, just observational data or just some data set that you collected. So just to be more formal, uh, the pairwise causal discovery task says, uh, given a pair of variables, A and B, so this could be, uh, for example, altitude and temperature, uh, you need to decide whether A causes B or B causes A. And I was telling you earlier, without parametric assumptions, uh, you can show that both graphs, for example, A cause B or B cause A, are compatible with the same data distribution. Uh, and of course, the full graph discovery task is even harder. Uh, which says that given a set of variables, infer a directed acyclic graph over them. And so you're not, not only inferring which pairs of, not only inferring the direction, you're also inferring which pairs of variables form an edge. Uh, many attempts have been made, but just the difficulty of learning causal relationships from observed data, uh, there were sobering results using state-of-the-art graph discovery algorithms. Uh, 
so there are some citations here and some of these papers, some of these data sets we also use uh, in our analysis. But essentially these people tried state-of-the-art methods on medical data sets, Arctic uh, discovery data sets, and they found that uh, there's a lot still to be done uh, with causal discovery. So let's start with pairwise discovery. What we'll try to do is to give you a sense of the benchmarks in each of the fields. First, I'll start with pairwise discovery and also full graph discovery, and then show you the delta or the improvement that we are seeing with the traditional methods with which used data and learned from observational data compared to the large language models, which, which are doing something different. And we'll come to that on what exactly they're doing. So let's start with the Tubingen benchmark. Uh, this is as simple a discovery problem as it goes. You're getting two variables and your goal is to determine whether the first variable causes the other or vice versa. You can see some examples here. There are about 100 pairs in this data set. Uh, so an example could be cement and compressive strength of concrete. And this data set actually contains such examples from multiple domains. Just based on the data, this is a challenging task. Most algorithms achieve about 70 to 80% accuracy, with the best being 83%. So if you want to apply LLMs, right? Uh, as you might be aware, LLMs operate on natural language. Right? So now that means we now need to determine a prompt which enables us to get these directional uh, outputs. So what we did was something very simple. Uh, for each pair in this data set, we would input a prompt, which essentially is kind of asking the LLM, which way do you think causality goes? Right? So we tried two versions. The first is two prompts per pair, where we literally ask, does A cause B and record the answer? Then we ask, does B cause A and record the answer? Uh, and then for the actual answer, we just average these two results from the LLM. And this actually was the first thing anyone might try and it worked reasonably well. But then based on recent research, we also tried a single prompt, which takes both of these options and just asks the LLM, which cause and effect relationship do you think is more likely? And we also include some chain of thought prompt reasoning uh, in this uh, prompt. And that helps us with getting also to know what reasoning the LLM is applying. So when we tried it on the tube engine benchmark, uh, we got some interesting results. I'm sure just showing you uh, an example of two answers that we got anecdotally. So there's one pair in this data set, which is the age of abalone, which is an organism, uh, and the length of abalone. And here, uh, the LLM answers correctly that the age causes the length. But a very similar example in this data set, which just is age of abalone and its diameter, on this one, the LLM gets it wrong. Right? So it, it thinks that changing the diameter would change its age. Uh, so this was kind of mixed results. And we were not sure what exactly is going on. Clearly, uh, LLMs are not robust at this kind of reasoning. But what we were surprised by is how fre less frequent the incorrect answers are. So even though I showed you one of these incorrect answers, actually, uh, GPT-4 obtains about 96% accuracy, uh, which is about 13 points higher than the previous state of the art. So the key results to look at here are first the covariance-based algorithms, which, as I told you, were getting about 83%. Then if you see many of the smaller language models like Ada, Babbage, Curie, they are not good for this task. They are all, attain almost random accuracy. Then you start seeing GPT 3.5 and text Da Vinci, which are getting about 83%, 87%. And we also see some improvements by the prompt. Just adding a system prompt, you're a helpful assistant, helps a lot. And then finally, we see that the single prompt template uh, obtains an even further gain in the accuracy. So we go from about 87 for the single for the double prompt to about 92 for the single prompt. And with GPT-4, we attain about 96, right? So these results show us that 
not only do LLMs are providing us a different kind of discovery, which we call knowledge-based because they're just looking at the variable names, but they are also giving us a window into how we could improve the causal discovery algorithms themselves, right? Because you can perhaps imagine complementary performances from both. We also saw some interesting use cases where LLMs might work with an expert to both augment the expert's expertise, uh, but then also help them discover new interesting things. In this case, for example, what we discover is that the expert really needs to be very precise about what they're asking. So an example was ozone concentration and radiation. If you just ask the question uh, like that, the LLM answers it incorrectly, but actually that's because it was looking at the stratospheric ozone concentration. When we reorient the question and ask about, no, no, we mean the ground level ozone, uh, the LLM answers it correctly. But then you might ask, maybe that's just a very popular data set. Maybe it's very simple. Uh, what about harder tasks? To answer that, we then moved to two different data sets. So I'll describe one here, which is about neuropathic pain. This is a much larger data set, about 221 nodes and 475 edges. And it also contains variable names that you and I may never encounter or know about, right? So what would you guess would be the relationship between, let's say, DLS C2C3 and left C3 radiculopathy? I don't know. But what we find is that even for this very specialized data set, uh, we just run the same prompts and were surprised to see GPT-3 and GPT-3.5, sorry, GPT-3.5 and 4 performing really well, right? So it's almost a repeat of the previous results. Smaller models don't work, but GPT-3.5 and 4 achieve more than 85% accuracy. And again, all they're doing it is that they're capturing the knowledge that they must have learned from the internet, from medical journals and whatnot, and then sort of transforming it for answering these very specific questions. We also see another example of how LLMs can augment a domain expert. So here, for example, there is no edge in the data set between L5 radiculopathy and obesity, uh, but the LLM actually gives an answer saying that there should be an edge and obesity can cause L5 radiculopathy. And we, this seemed plausible, so we went back and looked at the medical literature and seems like there are some risk factors, which there are some papers which show obesity as a risk factor. So LLMs can be used not just for suggesting new edges, but maybe also critiquing the existing edges that may a domain expert might have. So far, so good for pairwise discovery. Uh, it's still a toyish task for the real world because in the real world, you, you care about the full graph, right? So now I'm gonna to describe to you two experiments which we did for full graph discovery. Uh, the first is on the same neuropathic pain data set. And here we had a hundred pair subsample uh, from the same authors who created this data set. So now we need a three answers, right? So not just whether A causes B or B causes A, but also whether there's any edge between A and B, right? And that's a harder task, right? Because you have to also think about the existence of any edge or not. And so our prompt was exactly the, as it was before. All we do is that we add another answer, which is that no causal relationship exists. So our learning here was that the prompt really matters when dealing with LLMs. Uh, with the same data set, uh, two et al who created this data set had tried chat GPT, uh, but for them, the answer was probably in the negative because they were only getting an F1 score of 0.21 in recovering the true edges. And random here, for example, is 0.33, right? But when we tried the same data set, but with our single prompt, uh, we found that the results are much better. In fact, they are 3x more than previously reported results. Uh, and again, you see that we get about 0.68 F1 uh, using GPT 3.5. Now this is remarkable uh, because this is a really hard data set and even the existing methods are not able to achieve uh, such a high F1. We get the same story on an atmospheric science data set. 
and I think what we were really going for here was to collect data sets which are really very different from each other and also less popular so that we can actually test whether it's just a matter of a few kinds of relationships the LLM has learned or this knowledge is much more broader. And so with this atmospheric science data set, we also found a similar result. In fact, this is a much smaller data set, only 12 variables. So we were able to learn the full graph, no subsampling. And here we actually compared ourselves to state-of-the-art deep learning methods. So we compared ourselves to Notius, we compared ourselves to DAG GNN, and also a temporal algorithm called TCDF. Uh, and for this data set, again, we found that not only is LM-based algorithms competitive, uh, they're actually performing at a higher accuracy than existing discovery algorithms. So here, lower is better. And we found that GPT-4 has a lower number of errors compared to the existing state-of-the-art algorithms. And so all this is quite encouraging and it's showing us the importance and the promise of what LLMs can do. But at the same time, if you are a skeptic, you might also be thinking whether all of it is just memorization or all of it is just something the LLM had in its training set. And so to discuss this and the next part of the talk, uh, I'd like to invite my colleague, Emre Kacherman, to take it away. Thanks, Amit. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think a few of you also asked in the chat, you know, is, is this benchmark just memorized? And what does that mean for interpreting the, these experiments? So we were very curious about the same thing. H how do we know whether or not the large language model has simply memorized these uh, answers because it's seen the raw data? And what does that mean for how we interpret this, these, these results? So we did run a, a set of uh, uh, memorization tests uh, how this works is we ask the uh, tell the LLM uh, exactly what data we're about to give it. We say, you know, here's the readme for the data set, here's the URL for the data set on the internet, and we're going to list some sample rows of data and ask uh, the LLM to complete each row as best as possible. So we give, for example, the first two columns from the data set. Pair five is the row ID number. Age is the first uh, first uh, value for the you know the the, the, the column of the data. And then the uh, GPT model comes back and correctly completes the next, the rest of the row, for example. So here, this row is saying that uh, there is a um, relationship going from left to right between um, um, uh, the age and a length in the abalone uh, section of the data set. Um, so when we do this across all of the data sets, we see that uh, GPT is able to complete roughly 60% of the cells that we ask it to complete, and uh, 20 or 25% of the rows are completed without error, uh, depending on whether we're talking about GPT-3.5 or GPT-4. So the answer is yes, this tubing and data set is clearly in the, the training for the large language model. So then that makes us ask, well, what does this mean then? Uh, what are we actually testing in the benchmark? Um, so if we uh, were going to say like, this is a sign of really reasoning about fundamentals about the world. Uh, because the data set is memorized, we can't say that these results tell us that there is some real reasoning going on here. But what we can do is say that, well, we can break apart the knowledge-based discovery task, this idea of knowing how to express domain knowledge in a form where we need it in, uh, as two parts. One, we can say, uh, what is the likelihood that this knowledge is known by the LLM? So the LLM somewhere has read, has access to this information. We'll call that probability of D, that this, that this data is known. And secondly, can the LLM take this data in whatever form it was expressed in, in, uh, in its training data set? Can that be transformed, pulled out, identified, and transformed to answer a specific question when we have it? And that's what we say is this probably of why given D, given that the data is known. So once we see that the benchmark data is memorized, we know that we're not really measuring the a priori likelihood that any particular piece of knowledge is known by the LLM. Here, because we know that the training data set was seen by the LLM, what we're, we're basically conditioning, you know, saying we know that this data is, is available to the LLM. So what we are measuring 
uh, with uh, all of these ben with these benchmarks, the tubing and benchmark is how the LLM can process and transform that data into this necessary causal relationship when we ask it. And what do we mean by transform? Uh, what we mean is that the LLM is able to take this data that happens to be in a tabular format, for example, with you know arrows and specific symbols, and convert it into this question that says yes, you know A causes B versus you know B causes A. And while we only ran our memorization benchmark on um, the tabular data uh, on the tubing and the tabular data set, um, uh, the other data sets that we tested on the uh, uh, the neuropathic pain data set and the Arctic uh, sea data set, those two are also um, good examples of the kinds of transformations that we think the LLM is capable of. The neuropathic pain data set was not a t in a tabular format or in an English format, natural language format. The ne neuropathic pain data set was actually a JSON-based graph uh, format and uh, that expressed the edges in a, in a JSON format. And the uh, um, Arctic Sea data set was also in a different format altogether. So when we talk about um, um, uh, you know, this uh, process of transforming this knowledge, it is uh, uh, actually a significant, uh, covers a significant breadth of, of different kinds of transformations. Um, so the takeaways from this causal discovery section are then that large language models enable what we're calling a knowledge-based causal discovery. Uh, this is not the same task as a data-driven causal discovery. This is uh, really relying on uh, knowledge that's been captured by the large language model. It's not analyzing any of the data. So it is doing a very different task than past state-of-the-art causal discovery algorithms. This means that we can't expect it to... Um, we can't expect it to analyze data to uncover completely new relationships. You know, if we're doing really fundamental science, new measurements, we're doing something that has never been understood before, the large language model isn't going to analyze that data according to these benchmarks and, and uh, with this method and give us back results. But this is still really critical. As Ahmed mentioned, we've always uh, leaned on the analyst to express this domain knowledge. Uh, and that's been the burden of the, the human driving a causal analysis. And now we have a way to programmatically augment that human and help make sure that this process is just that much easier. When we expand from link-based to full full graph discovery, there are some additional challenges that we'll need to be work uh, that we'll need to work through. For example, helping the LLM distinguish between when we are talking about direct versus indirect causes. Um, and uh, making sure that uh, we can, for example, also help uh, reason about uh, um, confounding factors, for example, that are latent and not in the data. Um, um, I'll go ahead and now go move on to uh, LLMs and actual causality. So um, actual causality and causal judgments, uh, uh, just as a reminder, uh, uh, we've mostly been talking about type causality so far. This is also called general causality. And the idea is that uh, in type or general causality, we're interested in the underlying mechanism and how it works over a broad subpopulation. So for example, does smoking cause lung cancer is a general causality or type causality question. Actual causality is about inference over a single event. So rather than asking whether smoking in general causes lung cancer, we want to say, look, Bob has cancer. Bob is a smoker. Did Bob smoking cause his cancer? Very specific. Or in our in our um, uh, toy uh, toy store example from the beginning of the talk, you know, a customer saw a newspaper ad and bought toys. We want to know, uh, did the customer buy the toy because of this newspaper ad, and what would have happened, this is a counterfactual question, what would have happened if they hadn't seen the ad? Um, this now, understanding and answering these types of questions, especially in English, requires really bringing in a lot of additional context. So uh, for example, in this last example about whether what would have happened if a doctor hadn't washed their hands before surgery, uh, the one of the right answers is that the patient might have uh, gotten an infection. But, you know, the patient has not been mentioned explicitly here, and certainly infections haven't been mentioned either. But uh, so the question is, can the a large language model bring in that additional information uh, to this example? Does it know uh, the domain knowledge necessary to bring in that, that broader set of factors that are relevant? And 
so this is very related to the domain knowledge that we've been talking about in the causal discovery task, but now broadens to uh, uh, asking now the, the LLM to help us formalize uh, factors related to the causal question, which we'll call the causal frame. Um, issues related to necessary causality and sufficient causality about, you know, uh, whether a particular cause uh, is uh, necessary or sufficient to, to create an outcome. And then for some kinds of questions, we also care about whether uh, the events are normal or not, or whether uh, they're moral or what the intention of the actors were. These come into a lot of the reasons uh, into play uh, in a lot of the scenarios where we're asking about causality, like who do we blame? So the first aspect that we uh, investigated was uh, is counterfactual reasoning, a basic building block of actual causality that uh, uh, says what would have happened if we make if we had made one change uh, in 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 our situation. What would have been the alternate outcome? This is critical for reasoning about uh, about uh, attribution and blame and cause. Uh, and something that you know people do naturally in a lot of situations. It's also useful for decision making and planning too. So for this purpose, we use an existing uh, uh, counterfactual reasoning benchmark called CRAS that consists of 275 different counterfactual multiple choice questions. Uh, these are things like you know a question to set up a scenario: an oil tanker sailing across the ocean, and then a question: what would have happened if the oil tanker had broken up? And then you have a bunch of multiple choice uh, options. Um, uh, past LLMs have uh, done relatively poorly, but started to get better with uh, um, over the last few years, with top getting 72% accuracy and uh, Tex Da Vinci and GPT-35 getting up to 80, 87, 88% accuracy. And now in our experiments, we see GPT-4 achieving 92.4% accuracy. Uh, humans are still doing much better than this at 98% accuracy, but you can see that that uh, there have been some uh, significant strides. So this was these, this indicates that uh, uh, large language models are making a substantial jump in their counterfactual reasoning uh, ability. Um, now, when we dig into some of the reasons why LLMs uh, are making mistakes, we do see, again, some of the same kinds of errors that we saw earlier, where the GPT is providing a reasonable answer, but uh, because there's some ambiguity in the way the question is set up, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, GPT gets the multiple choice answer wrong. So for example, in one case, we asked the LLM, what would happen if a man catches a water balloon, given that he's been able to catch a ball in the past? The benchmark answer is that uh, uh, he's going to get wet, but the LLM actually is not sure and says uh, the person might get wet or not, depending on whether the water balloon bursts when they catch it. And so clearly it's understanding the, the concepts and repeating them back in text appropriately, but not making the correct mapping to a particular uh, answer that the benchmark is ask, uh, is looking for specifically. So we have more work to do to figure out how to resolve those ambiguities uh, and benchmark them appropriately. Um, some of the, uh, the uh, some of the other uh, key components of uh, some of the other key components of actual causality involve reasoning about what's necessary and what's sufficient. Um, um, now, necessary causality uh, asks whether some event, uh, some outcome event uh, will not occur if some uh, precursor event, some cause does not occur. So, uh, and sufficient causality is whether an event, uh, an outcome event will occur uh, 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 as long as event C occurs. So uh, is event C alone uh, sufficient to cause the outcome event to occur? Um, and Sufficiency, it's worth pointing out, is a little bit diffi more difficult because we have to determine the causal frame, what's relevant to the particular task we're asking about. Um, as an example, uh, let's say that we have a scenario where, as, as an example of this causal frame and its criticality, you can imagine asking um, uh, asking any question, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Alice throws a rock at a window and the window breaks, is throwing the rock sufficient for breaking the window? 
And you might say, well, it depends on how strong the glass is. It depends maybe on how uh, how big the rock is. Those uh, are those things relevant to the causal frame. And at an extreme, you know, uh, uh, level, you could even ask, well, no, uh, uh, it's not sufficient for the rock to be thrown. The you know, the Big Bang had to happen, and the universe had to start. Right? Clearly, there's a line here where we draw a line. We say there's some things that are not relevant to how we think about this problem. Um, and that's what makes a sufficiency a little bit more difficult. So we evaluate these uh, questions of ne necessity and sufficiency by giving uh, evaluation vignettes where we provide some input context that focuses on uh, particular kinds of challenges that uh, make actual causality uh, difficult, uh, called things like uh, uh, types of problems like overdetermination, um, or you know, uh, preemption or late preemption. Um, we use uh, uh, both an existing data set here by Kufner, uh, uh, published in 2021, and we also uh, adapt these vignettes into novel vignettes to ensure that we can identify the uh, quality of the LLM's reasoning uh, about necessity and sufficiency when the results are not uh, memorized. And what we see here is, is that um, uh, GPT-3, uh, uh, 3.5, uh, uh, is getting not very great results, 40 to 60% results for necessity and sufficiency across these two data sets. Um, and when we move up to GPT-4, we see a really big jump to uh, you know, 86%, uh, 92%, 78% uh, correct um, identification of necessity and sufficiency. So uh, what we're seeing here on actual causality is that there are substantial improvements in the large language models, counterfactual reasoning ability, uh, six, uh, significant really uh, jumps in how GPT-4 can understand scenarios and identify necessity and sufficiency in a way that simply wasn't possible before. Um, and we think that this is now uh, super exciting because it's bringing us a new capability to start to programmatically analyze and reason about these actual causality scenarios that really we uh, had uh, no idea how to uh, um, automatically analyze before. So there's still work to be done to understand the limits and the um, and the kinds of um, uh, the the limits and the the you know the best way to uh, uh, automate these approaches, but the capability we think is is now there to make uh, big uh, leaps. I want to spend the next few minutes talking about the implications uh, of uh, the work we've uh, we've of the results we've shown here for uh, knowledge based causes of the discovery and for uh, improving the uh, 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 these results on actual causality. So I'm going to start by first really highlighting what we think is new here with causality right now. We see LLMs providing domain knowledge that previously was only available via human experts. Uh, the LLMs are able to provide this explicitly when we ask it for this information, and also we see it using uh, this information implicitly in background knowledge in the, the context of the actual causality vignettes. This is really exciting because in, in uh, our experience with people using our causal tools and working with data scientists across a wide variety of problems, we've seen that correctly pulling out and expressing this domain knowledge, finding the right domain expert, finding the set of domain experts that covers a particular problem area, and getting them to understand causal contents well enough to express, uh, express them in the formal way that algorithms need is the place where where uh, people fall down and have uh, you know the most the most challenges. So the ability to support uh, this stage of uh, the analysis process is really exciting. Uh, secondly, we see that LLMs uh, are able to provide uh, more flexible and natural language interaction for causal analysis. It's just very nice to see how we can start to express this hope of expressing causal questions in a, uh, a textual, natural manner in, in a way that I, we think is going to augment existing tools, which are much more formal and rigid. Um, 
And finally, the ability to extract key primitives from actual causality questions really opens up the possibility of, of systematizing the analysis of actual causality in practice, something that, that again, has not been um, uh, in the realm of possibility before. At the same time, there's one, one key thing that we believe is not changing at all with causality, and that's the need for rigorous and well-documented analysis. Especially when we're talking about high risk and high value tasks, we have to ensure that decision making is correct. This means that we can't simply call out to the LLM and uh, look at its response and trust it. We need to make sure that the reasoning it's doing is something that we can verify, that we can recreate, etc., and inspect very carefully. Now, we think that this leads to uh, several uh, implications for practitioners that are just around the corner. One is the ability to augment human expertise with large language models, assisting in the tasks that they are doing uh, every day already, uh, uh, assisting in graph creation and validation, of uh, uh, critiquing graphs that have been gener uh, that have been generated by people uh, for you know, as a robustness check. Um, and we think that uh, this can be extended even to uh, have LLMs assist in other aspects of the causal analysis process, like identification of negative controls for improved validation. Um, so we see that uh, these LLMs are going to improve uh, the end-to-end -end usefulness of existing causal tools. Um, and then we see this developing into a more fluid conversational interface to use these types of, of tools uh, using more, more um more natural domain-specific questions, for example. We also see this work really opening up many fascinating new research questions. One is really understanding what is knowledge-based causal discovery and what's the best way to combine knowledge-based and covariance data-based analyses. Um, second, we see LLM-guided effect inference, uh, how to integrate the LLM's domain knowledge into all of the different stages of the causal analysis process when we're dealing with different identification strategies like instrumental variables, when perhaps we're uh, needing to do partial graph-based effect estimation. What are really all of the different details that uh, uh, these processes require where we can lean on the LLM's uh, domain knowledge and use it to guide these processes? Um, I want to uh, and uh, highlight one more of, 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 of these, and that's systematizing actual causality uh, and uh, attribution. How do we uh, formalize the way that we take a look at an actual causality problem and then fluidly go back and forth between uh, whatever logic or database analysis is necessary for answering that question? Uh, this is something, this is probably the, the aspect that I'm most excited about, just thinking about how people's causal questions are often uh, grounded in very specific scenarios, very specific events that have occurred, and how when we're answering those, we often decompose this into uh, many different types of causal sub-questions. Uh, in order to get at our eventual task. And I see that you know, systematizing actual causality is going to be something that enables us to uh, start to um, um, uh, build up that process um, of, of componentizing uh, causal questions into sub-questions and, and um, really expanding the set of causal uh, scenarios that we can, that we can uh, have our computing tools help us with. Of course, uh, uh, a final uh, uh, research question that's critical is understanding improving and improving the causal reasoning in the large language models themselves. It's doing well, but it's not yet perfect. Figuring out when and why it fails and finding the ways uh, to improve that performance um, is going to lead to, I think, all sorts of uh, uh, fascinating avenues. So to conclude, you know, coming into this talk, human domain knowledge is critical for causal analysis. Uh, and LLMs are able to mimic this capability uh, through knowledge-based causal discovery and similar applications in the context of actual causality, uh, understanding you know, uh, causal frames, counterfactual inference, uh, necessity and sufficiency. And in practice, we think this is going to reduce the burden on the human domain expert significantly and enable uh, causal formal rigorous causal analysis to be used by a much broader set of people for a much broader set of problems. Um, and at the same time, opening up really fast, really exciting new research questions uh, around how we 
can now start to combine our systems for logical and covariance-based analysis much more fluidly, much more deeply to enable us to do a lot more. Um, at this point, I'll uh, end the talk and say thank you. Thank you, Emre and Amit, for such an illuminating presentation. This has just given us a lot of food for thought. Um, and I'm a huge fan of this idea of um, collaboration between LLM systems and human domain experts. So really, really, um, really interesting. Lots to chew on. Let's um, let's dive into some questions. So uh, we have a few questions from the Metaculous team. And, and then we have also some questions from the audience. So I'll start with a couple. Um, from Kareel on our team, do you have some hypotheses for why prompting a model with this line, you are a helpful assistant for causal reasoning, why does that improve um, the results? Do you think that it starts applying internal mechanisms that are more useful? Or do you think it could uh, be a context that allows it to reuse pre-memorized information better? Or do you have another idea for why that, that might help? It's difficult to say what the large language model is doing internally. But one way to think about kind of the end-to-end -end task that the LLM is, is, is um, trying to present is that um, it's trying to create a set of words that match a particular probability distribution. The, the probability distribution given by its entire training data set. This is a, a really you know, great target, but it doesn't actually match your kind of uh, task specific utility function at any particular point in time. So if you're trying to do a causal analysis, the probability distribution of you know, documents related to causal analysis and correct causal reasoning are not matching the probability distribution of words across you know, the whole world, like fiction, for example, right? So what happens is when you add a prompt at the beginning of, of your document and say your causal analysis, what you're an uh, expert, what you're doing is you're now uh, instructing the LLM to create, to pull from the probability distribution of words conditioned on that, on that first sentence. And by conditioning your probability distribution on that first sentence, what you're trying to do is shape your probability distribution to match your task specific utility. So when we say you're a causal analysis, we're saying, well, now only pull from the words that make sense in a document that starts with your causal analysis expert. That's a very kind of end-to-end. -end, it doesn't say anything about what the LLM is doing internally and how it's achieving this. But that's that's the, a concept that's helped me, I think, think about these things. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I'll go to another question. This is from Nikos on our team, and it also very much mirrors a question from the audience. So um, here it is. What do you think is the relationship between causal inference capabilities and the ability to make predictions? How much do you expect LLMs to get better at making predictions in the future? Amit, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'm just thinking of uh, what kind of uh, predictions. Uh, so in the case of, for example, natural language benchmarks, uh, the typical kind of prediction tasks uh, like sentiment analysis or predicting uh, different kinds of properties in natural language, uh, LLMs are already state of the art, right? They are beating existing algorithms. Uh, but I think maybe this question is more about uh, predicting the future in the sense of if you have a complex system, uh, you want to predict uh, I don't know how the economy will shape up in the next year, I don't know, or, or maybe even harder tasks, right? So let's just separate these out. So I think if you're talking about prediction of natural language or even like the counterfactual questions that we just showed you, uh, I think LLMs are already the best or the techniques that we have right now. Uh, but yeah, when we talk about modeling complex processes and making predictions, uh, I think what my take is that we might not need to use LLMs for that. What we might do is to use LLMs for bringing up the basic system dynamics or the causal graph or any kind of world model that is usually hard to get. We may be able to use LLMs to provide us that world model. And then, and then we can use any of the standard techniques of prediction uh, conditioned on that world model. Uh, I feel if accuracy is what you're going for, maybe the best way to use LLMs is as a way to give you a robust world model and then use any of the techniques that are already available uh, that can use them as priors. 
very interesting. Okay. Um, I'll go to a question from Ben Cotier. I'm interested in how much LLMs, in how LLMs do <laughs> at causality or how well they do at causality due to common sense understanding. Do they perform worse when the direction of causality is counterintuitive? That's a fascinating question. It's not one that we've, I think, studied deeply or noticed in the errors that we've seen so far. But if we were to come across a benchmark that of such uh, counterintuitive causal mechanisms, I think uh, it would be a that would be a really fun thing to dig into. Yeah, I, I agree. I think yeah, it would be some something to try out. Because there has been some work which shows that uh, LLMs are more accurate when the question's answer matches what is expected. So I think you can call it common sense reasoning, but also just what's more expected to, to be the answer. Uh, yeah, I think if you have suggestions uh, on what that kind of data set or what get that those kind of questions could be in causality, I think that would be fab very interesting to try. It can actually give us some more insight into what LLMs are, are really doing as well. Absolutely. There is a lot to unpack. I think we maybe have time for a couple more. Um, so Ryan Watkins asks, have you played with LLMs to see how well they do at finding problems in the causal analysis done by a human? For instance, finding inferences made by humans that are not supported by, in provided data. Yeah, so, so maybe I can start. I think this is this is a fascinating question. I think this is where honestly we think that uh, the future lies for, for causal practice and research. Uh, what we have tried in the context of these benchmarks are cases where the doctors who created the benchmark, the pain benchmark, for example, uh, I gave an example where they did not think that obesity may cause uh, one of the radiculopathies but actually there is published research which says that, right? So now you can imagine a scenario where if that doctor is again creating the data set for, for their research, uh, they might create that and then just ask the LLM to see if there are any missing edges or to see if there's something that they missed or, or that should be added. Uh, at the same time, you can also imagine critiquing, right? So you can imagine any given graph that's, that's out there, uh, you can use LLMs to critique and sort of help the person uh, adjust uh, their graph. Uh, as Embry pointed out, this can also go in the full pipeline of your analysis. It does not need to sort of end at causal graph discovery, but you may also think that you are just thinking about an instrumental variable, right? So if, if you are an economist, I think a lot of times you work with instrumental variables. And so if you have one, you can just ask the LLM whether it's the right one or not, or you can ask what might be the other confounding factors that uh, might be there in my outcome and treatment relationship. Right? So anecdotally, anecdotally, we found that LLMs give quite useful answers. As long as you are an expert, I think you can make use of those examples really well to, to either critique your graph, to find unobserved confounders that you may not have thought about or or even to sort of think about robustness checks. Well, I can tell you that there are way more questions than I think we have time for today, which just indicates to me how fascinating this topic is and, and how interesting uh, people are, are finding your work. So um, really just want to say thank you both uh, for, for joining us. This has been really brilliant. Um, and I hope that we can find ways to continue the conversation for folks who have more questions. Um, Emre and Amit have offered to stay in touch. Um, Christian is going to post their contact details now um, in, in the chat. So feel free to reach out to them on Twitter um, or via email. Um, and I will just end uh, with an, uh, an invitation to join us in a couple of weeks, we're gonna continue the series um, with another talk. This one will be uh, on a view from the enterprise suite, how applied AI governance works today. 
uh, featuring Ramsey Brown, the CEO of Mission Control and the AI Responsibility Lab. Um, and just to reiterate, we plan on really continuing the series um, with more technical deep dives. So um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you all at a future talk. And um, please join me in, in thanking Emre and Amit one more time for, for being with us today. It was a true pleasure. Thank you so much. The pleasure was ours. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.